Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, Tim Oninger. Tim, how you doing? I'm doing great, man. Mr. Don Gray, back from, uh, where are you at, Don? Atlanta? I'm still in Atlanta. Still in Atlanta. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. And we have a newcomer tonight, Mr. Brad Rasmussen. Brad, how are you tonight, sir? I'm doing awesome. Thank you very much. It's nice to uh, be part of this and nice to meet a couple of other folks that I run across on Twitter from time to time. That's great. Brad, thanks for joining us. For those in the audience who are not familiar with you, could you give the the quick introduction and uh, just a little bit of your background. Sure. I'm, uh, I'm a technologist. Uh, used to do a lot of hacking around inside the Unix kernel and performance software and those kinds of things. And I've not written any code now for a while. So um, I hang out and talk to a lot of agile coaches, but I don't necessarily do agile coaching as a career right now. I lead a technology team that uh, is part of the financial services industry. And I've uh, been around software my whole life, so it's pretty interesting uh, to me how we do software, how we as people actually get software done and deliver value to the business. So hopefully I can can add to that conversation tonight. No, that sounds wonderful, Brad, and thanks again for joining us. Tonight, uh, Tim has actually teed up an interesting conversation. He's posed a question, I think it was on Twitter, and there's been a few tweets uh, this week already, about where does work come from? So I'm going to let Tim set the stage on this topic, but it, uh, this is one of those where we got started on a talk and it's just a fascinating little conversation that, that got started and we had to stop and start the podcast. So I want to get right back into this. So Tim, uh, could you, could you kind of frame this out for the, the listeners and then we'll get right back into the discussion. So speaking of the humanity and the human side of Agile, um, I've noticed that different organizations trying to do an Agile transformation will experience it very differently. In some cases, it is just constant overburden, and all the people are separated up, and they all work individually, and they're held accountable, and the work's made visual to make sure that there is an opportunity for public shaming. And other places, managers take their hands off. There's, you know, a lot of uh, autonomy and pairing and mobbing and and all that kind of stuff. So it's does work come from uh, individual assignments, accountability, you know, visualization? pressure does work come from freedom autonomy whatever is work more like a factory or more like an ad agency in the way that it's managed so is your question really did daniel pink get it right or uh, did taylor have it right the question is really about knowledge work so everybody sure. we know everybody we touch is making uh, assessments via testing they're making decisions and policies they're building software they're making choices about what will be done next. So that's, we're all knowledge workers. No, um, I don't think have showed up at work this morning and, and hammered steel into new shapes. So where does our work come from? I think our work comes from, hopefully from uh, us as a team working with whatever business we're in. We, we all write software for different reasons for different businesses and I think where it comes from, at least uh, in my most recent experience, is our team knowing what our business is, uh, collaborating very heavily with business leaders who are trying to manage the business side of our company, and knowing what they need and then developing that software again together. It's not in a stovepipe. It's not uh, command and control where we're told what to do. It's, hey, what's the next cool thing we can do? What's the next most important thing we can do? We have that discussion. We go back and we develop that and show it to them. So that, that's kind of where it comes from, at least in my current world. Hasn't always been that way, though. 
And in my current world, it's sort of odd in that, well, like Brad, we're sort of trying to get in this groove of doing what the client needs and the customer needs and what some user needs. The messages that are rolling around in the developer's heads are still very, very command and control. It's, it's kind of a weird paradigm that I'm in right now. So we talk about reducing cycle time, and we talk about that by reducing waste, by uh, minimizing delay times. And what the developers are hearing is increase velocity, go faster, work harder. And so while the leadership is actually fairly in line with what you suggested, Brad, of not command and control, working together for the client, for the end purpose, the developers are actually hearing the old crack the whip Taylorism. And it's kind of interesting. Do you, you think know? that message is, is unintentional, Don? That it's what ends up getting measured is what gets managed, but that may not be the intent of, of the management team? And I guess what I mean by that is we can easily measure output. And there are metrics in place and there's tools in place that measure productivity. Like how many hours were you, were you at your keyboard? Those are easy things to measure but they really don't say anything about the work done. And do you think the focus on those metrics can cause that message to, to be in developers' heads? Well, so there, there's two thoughts real quick. Yes, uh, there are some things that are easy to measure that are not necessarily valuable. And I'm wondering if we've drifted a little, if I've kind of drifted the conversation away from where does, where, wh what is this thing about work? What is this thing we call work for knowledge workers? You know, Tim talked about I'm not hammering steel for eight hours a day. Or I'm not moving coal, and if I change the shape and, of my shovel and give me an extra $2 an hour because I shoveled more coal, I get more money and I'm a happier person. So I, I don't know. Is this really about where does work come from or what, does, what, what motivates us? I'm, I'm still a little fuzzy here. One of the things that's already come out is people are talking about there's this alignment thing, right? knowing what it is that somebody wants so that you can give it to them. And that seems to be something that allows people to do work or do the right work or do work enthusiastically. I don't know what's the right thing to say here. Um, and I think that's fair. I think that any kind of an organization, if you don't really know what it is you're supposed to be doing, um, that you're going to thrash a lot and, and look for anything you can do, whether it's the most valuable thing or not. So I think alignment and a good goal is one of the things that work comes from. Seems fair enough. Now you, we talked about metrics, right? And certainly there are how many hours you put in. I had uh, I had quoted uh, on on Twitter. Uh, one of my old bosses said that if you don't put in four hundred hours a month, you're not even doing your job. And it became pretty clear that there was a an hour mill. What we're doing is selling our hours to the company. And the big question about value was about hours. We would have the uh, employee of the year is the person who put in the most hours in the prior year. He would get a little engraved piece of metal, has his name on it, and he'd get a $25 gift certificate. That's, uh, that's what you get for putting in more hours than anyone else. He, by the way, the guy who won it every single year had children and a wife, um, but slept at his desk more often than not. You know, is that work? We talked about the secondary conversation. I have a blog about rules for large organizations. So the secondary conversation works like this. Um, no matter what you talk to your boss about, if you're talking to your boss, you're talking about your job. So I think that work in that sense is whatever your boss expects you to do, either making your boss happy or you're not. Maybe that's what the theory of work is, is are we exist to make our superior officers happy. Well, I, I would hope that, that we go to work each day to, to bring value to an organization and to have a demonstrable way to express the value that we brought. Right. And so, I mean, that would mean that our insights, our experiences, our skill sets, I mean, that's where our work comes from. I mean, our work comes from, it's, it's all in our head, right? That's where our work is born. That's how the the work is expressed through fingers on a keyboard. And so it's a more kind of nebulous idea. But but it, ultimately, I think it's the outcomes that we help influence and produce through that thought that translates to 
to some kind of end product. Yeah, I was having a conversation today with a developer on uh, a, a team I'm working with, and it was all around what makes us want to come to work? Why, why do we come to work? And what we kind of landed on, and I agree with this, is we want to believe that we're adding some value and that there's some appreciation for what we're doing. And in the end, our customers see that value and, and that is a product we delivered to them. And they're going, that's cool. I like that. I need that. I want that. Whatever, whatever the product is, again, we're writing software for a reason. And when the user of said software gives feedback that says this is really good, that's a pretty satisfying thing for a knowledge worker. Now, in a lot of places, uh, that connection between customer and developer doesn't exist. You're so far away from that chain where you're writing software and you get zero feedback. That's a tough place to live long term, I think. Uh, And so I think a lot of people are looking for, I did this. Did anybody care? And if they did, I want to hear that. That's valuable to us, I think. And so, Brad, I think that's an important point. And so I would wonder if there's a difference in the work that that you're uh, developer, the one that, that delivered a valuable thing, got good feedback, and then that cycle continues. If there's a difference in the work that that person does versus the person who does not get that feedback, the, per- the person that is disconnected and is almost just shipping it in every day. And if, is that the space that Tim's talking about? Is that the, you know, where does work come from? Is it a, is it a I'm getting paid, I'm punching a clock, or is it I'm, I'm inspired and trying to do great things? Is that the is that the distinction we're making with this, Tim? Well, there, there are different theories of work, right? Certainly, if I was working at a, uh, a, a three-penny nail factory, if I make more nails than other people, then uh, a more valuable employee, the guy who makes the most three-penny nails at a three-penny factory. Unless, of course, I'm on a team. It's this other theory of work, you know, is it about a collaboration to produce the best outcome to our customers? Don talks about limiting waste and and uh, short cycle time, you know, how do we get the value out there quicker? Brad talks about, you know, here they know their customers. How can they be helpful to them? How can they make their users more awesome? Hey, making user awesome. Where'd I hear that? Oh, that's modern agile. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, where does it come from? Would you let your people work together or would you separate them? Does that make more work? Does it help it get done better? I can just speak to to my role and my experience. I let them choose. So I don't dictate how the work is done. And and so they they self-organize into into twos, into threes, into fours, whatever they feel the right configuration is, and they find a way to deliver on the the valuable prioritized features and epics and and stories that together collaboratively that the that we in the business have decided on. I think part of your question is it depends. If they have the freedom to self-organize, then then that kind of magic or alignment or whatever kind of word we put on it comes from the group of people. Yeah, and, and I'll actually mirror that. Our world, uh, I back away and I let the teams decide. Um, we have multiple Kanban boards and the team gets to choose which Kanban board are we going to focus on for a week, for two weeks, three weeks, whatever the time frame is. We're not strict about sprints like some places are, but we do have some time boxing that we try to say, hey, in this time period, we're going to work on this thing or this board. But how the team decides to break up in parts, whether the whole team swarms on it, whether they break up and split apart and work on a couple of different Kanban boards, that's their choice each time they do planning. Uh, And it works very, very well. Uh, I think it's mostly in part because they're very in tune with what the business needs and that feedback cycle is also there. What I think is cool, though, is so, you know, here's here's Brad again with, you know, they have autonomy and alignment. Here you are talking about autonomy and alignment and things get done under that system. And, you know, the darker place it comes from is I get to see a lot of organizations where they're pretty well convinced that it's all about pressure. Um, you know, there is a very strong old world theory that people don't want to work and they only show up because they're trading their hours for a paycheck. And so as a manager, your job is to get your dollars worth by making sure you have the maximum utilization of each person. And so you know, that, that calls for you to have one-on-one management of all your, your direct reports. It requires you to make sure you know what each person is working on and that there's enough work for them to be very busy, hopefully a little bit of a stretch goal to pressure on. And, you, and a lot of people think that the reason you have a Kanban board or a storyboard is to put shame on people who aren't getting their story 
stories completed. So you know, there's a personal, individual pressure because you're publicly visible. And because of that, they never really reach a productive state. Everybody does only the things they know as well as they know how. And what I'm hoping we can do in the world is to turn that around to where we start to see, you no, know, actually, teams, autonomy, alignment, um, pairing, mobbing, whatever's needed, seems to actually have a better result for us. And this has been my case across the board. You know, Tim, to your point, I think those things you just rattled off are counterintuitive to many uh, when it comes to management theory. And if you go back and look at when those management theories were developed and whether or not uh, knowledge workers were part of the workforce at that point in time, I think in there you might find some of the answer as to what's there. It's, it's definitely there. I've been part of those worlds. Uh, I've chosen to leave those worlds because of that. But it comes from, I think, these theories that have been in place for 50, 60, 70 years or longer. And we haven't adapted to the fact that knowledge work is a different kind of work. And the motivation for knowledge workers is typically different. Well, and that speaks to the metaphors we use when we talk about work. You know, we talk about, I mean, even Kanban comes from manufacturing, physical manufacturing. So when we start to use incorrect metaphors as we describe our work, we bring all of the history and rules, constraints, actors, and possibilities with those metaphors. So we need to be very careful. The closest metaphor I found for knowledge work is knowledge work. It's different than anything else I've ever done and I've ever seen. Yeah. And, and so we have to find a new way to describe the possibilities and the actions and the re results of this work because there's nothing else like it. The, perhaps the closest things like it might be art. I mean, think about it. As a developer, I take nothing and create something. I can take brain stuff and manifest it in the real world. And my background is in manufacturing. So when I wrote code, it was like, okay, da 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 da, bang, machinery starts. Things get hot, things get cold, stuff moves down the line. And so art is possibly the closest metaphor. And have you ever tried to look at art as a repeatable process? Well, yeah. I think that maybe it is, though, right? Um, ad agents, if you take a look at, like, the Super Bowl ad. No, nah, this year the ads weren't that great, but go ahead, Tim. If you look at an ad agency, I have a friend who actually works in the advertising space, he, but he does compensation, not ads. He talks about uh, they have some people there who just – a few times a year, they'll have the right campaign at the right time, and it'll be worth millions and millions of dollars. They're not being rated by how many campaigns they turn out per week. They're only being really um, valued on the outcomes they produce. Does it let the client make millions, which, of which they get a slice? And I think that's really probably the right idea for knowledge workers. I would hate to manage by managers by counting how many new policies they put in place every week. Could you imagine the mess? I think that goes back to a lot of people want to see what they're doing as valuable, and that's measured by the customer feedback. And if customers are saying, hey, that's good, that means they're using your product more, which means you're probably selling more if it's a, if it's a front-end portal of some kind or whatever. But it goes back to the value that's being delivered. Uh, and I think we lose that oftentimes. And we have to remember, what's the value that we're delivering every day? I think that's right. And I think that we've now bounced uh, on and off of this several times about the pressure underneath it is that everybody wants to feel like they're doing something important, helpful, useful. It's a good use of their time. You know, I talked about people wanting to please their managers. You talked about people who are wanting to please their customers, people being in tune with the business. Well, uh, Tim, this is part of our DNA, right? I mean, everyone wants to slay the dragon. I mean, it's the hero's journey, right? It, it's the, the doing something important. It's the, the, the you know, taking on the, the quest and, and succeeding at the end. And uh, lacking that, I mean, what, where does that leave a person? Right. I mean, if you don't have that sense of accomplishment, what have you really done? And I, and I think I've met far too many developers who have lost that. 
right? And I I think we've all been tempted in that space too. You're micromanaged way too much. Um, there's no autonomy in your work. It's it's you've been driven down to a you know follow this. 372 step process and then repeat it the next day and the next day and the next day. Where does that work? What does that work look like? And where does your value? What is your value? You're, you're pushing keys to a prescribed process. Where is that sense of accomplishment? And it's just how we're wired. And to work against that uh, seems odd to me. So I think what I just heard you say, Ryan, is it's about the value of being a person. We've talked about value to the client. We've talked about value to the company. But doesn't value really start valuable to myself? I think always. Absolutely. It does. And then to be coherent, it does need to extend through the company into the client. But, you know, the theory of work for me personally is I've had a lot of fun. So I, I had a client who let me escape, and I know this isn't really programming, but Back in 2014, I got a chance to write some Visual Basic in Excel for about two weeks. And I had the greatest time. I was giggling because I was having so much fun. Because there's, it's the art of creation. I I loved it. Yeah, you used the art uh, analogy earlier. And I've uh, often thought the same thing. And you're actually the first person that I've interacted with that brought that out in a conversation before I did. So good job out of you. Uh, And I've also used music. Music is another thing that I think comes right back at uh, knowledge workers, creating something out of nothing other than what's in my head. And it also has more of a pattern to it, a logical pattern to it than maybe art does. Art can be a little more scattered, I think. Music starts taking that scattering and brings it into something a little more refined, I think. I agree. And it, it, yes, absolutely. And it's, there's patterns and there's, uh, repetitions and there's building there's crescendos yes but also think about the relationship between an artist and a client so earlier we talked about how a company pays a person to spend x number of hours in a seat and that's the trade-off you're making an artist however sells their time for an outcome and they're selling their abilities for an outcome and that and that's I mean, you're not asking an artist to put in 40 hours and see what happens. You're commissioning a portrait of your family. You're commissioning all of these different end goals with an expected outcome. And that relationship is a little different. In that you're paying for a result, not for time. Absolutely. And perhaps that's the relationship change that that we need for knowledge workers overall. That that realization that um, we're paying for a res- an outcome. You know, the application is an outcome. The earned value is an outcome. Whatever it is that you're measuring or expecting, as opposed to 40 hours at a keyboard. And and I think that mind shift could actually change the way everyone views the kind of work we're doing. But there's an ugly truth hidden in there. What you just said is paying for an outcome. What is the value of an outcome? The hardest single thing I've come across for people to do in changing how they view software development is, what is the value to the end user? How many dollars is this really worth? Product owners or somebody prioritizes and ranks based on value, but what's the dollar value? I mean, how many dollars is this really worth? How do you compute that? And then how do you factor in all the different layers of overhead to say, okay, this person only typed on his keyboard one twelfth of his time but his value was 80% of the money we get from the company or from the client into the company. Yeah, it's not the keyboard time, it's the think time. And the think time can't be quantified until you do some keyboard time to do something with the think time. And, and we have a hard time measuring that. Well, yeah, Tim is the one who wrote 11, what was it, Tim? 11 twelfths of your time is thinking. So um, you lost version control and you had to type in your changes from the previous day. How long would it take you just to rekey the changes? Most people answer that it's between 20 and 40 minutes in most groups. Um, so, you know, half an hour out of six hours, that's about one twelfth um, can be represented by the physical effort of typing. And the rest, I ask, what, what were they doing? And they all laugh at me, they think it's funny. Um, well, they had to read the code, had to understand the requirements, they had to figure out what the tests are, need to know what the side effects were, could be, what risk 
they were under. Uh, we had to talk to other people about the problem and hypothesize as an experiment. So it's all thinking. They really are doing experimental thinking, even on you know the simpler kinds of features. So about 11 twelfths of our work is just communicating. And most of those experiments happen inside the head. And how does so this tie the back to work? The think the, the the theory of work. So this is where Tim, you've had a ton of influence on me, and it's that cognitive load that I think really impairs a lot of people in the space. So if eleven twelfths of our time we're we're in our headspace, and we're trying to uh, think through problems, learn things, uh, experiment uh, on the fly. Um, just thinking through theories and all of those things. If we have this huge amount of cognitive load, if we're worried about a metric that our management is tracking, if we're worried about uh, the perception of um, capacity or utilization because we're reading a book and not typing, all those things, I think, start weighing down our ability to actually think through and do those activities that we really need to get done so that that one-twelfth of our time is truly beneficial. So kind of my theory that I'm, I'm settling in on is based on Tim Galway's. Do you know Galway's Law? No. Oh, this is a great piece of work. So Galway's Law is, is that um, performance equals potential minus interference. That's a really powerful idea. And he's applied that to teaching p- people golf. He's applied that to teaching people um, tennis. And he even has an inner game of work book. Tim Galloway is pretty, um, pretty awesome. So if you think about that, think about the potential of a developer minus the interference. So you know what comprises potential, what comprises interference? And it may be that metric mongering and competition against other developers and the like, maybe those are just interference. Probably along with assignment to two, three, four, five, six projects, the meetings that take place and all of those other things that uh, cause those disruptions. That's interesting, Tim. Yeah, so I, I think that's important. So, so here's a good question for you then. What comprises potential for a developer? What, what decides what they are capable of doing? So if you take it from a system standpoint, their potential would be directly tied to the opportunity that they have to do the best thinking possible, right? And so the systems in place that um, impact, affect, enhance, or diminish uh, their ability to think would be related there. I would think so. And probably there's some, you know, in any field, there's some base of knowledge you have to have first. So if I don't know, like the um, Tomcat and Java technical stack, it's going to be probably pretty hard for me to great, write some great, you know, efficient Java there, right? I would assume. I- I think that's true of of any job where a a tool or system or other thing is needed to perform that function. You have to have base knowledge of that tool set so that you can then create something using that tool set. So well, I think that that applies everywhere. Yeah, if I don't know how to weld and you tell me that I need to weld, then I'm really in a lot of trouble and my whole self-worth is going to be tied up in my inability to weld for the next N days or weeks. So I remember J.B. Rainsberger came on the, the podcast, and he, he talked about uh, essential and accidental complication. The essential complication would be the, the natural disaster, the uncontrollable events, the things that are going to happen that distract us from our work. The accidental uh, would be the skill set, so the ability to weld or the ability to, to know how to configure Tomcat correctly with, uh, with all of your uh, configuration management and your deployment and those things. And those are, are always in play on, uh, on our projects. Impacts a wide variety of things, you know, up and down the chain, whether it's uh, estimates, forecasts, things like that up through management, all the way down to the ability to deliver. I mean, those two things are always going to be playing uh, either in our headspace or even in the physical product. I think that's so. So maybe, you know, sometimes you have somebody who's, you know, struggling with their work, some team, and maybe they just need to know the stack better. Maybe you could get, you know, um, an improvement of, you know, three days work per two weeks, you know, on days per fortnight, just by letting them learn the things they need to know. On the other hand, I've had managers tell me, you know, you're not paid to learn, you're paid to write code. And so the permission comes back into it, right? If I got to please my boss, that can become an interference. That means I have to just 
flop around at work. And then maybe when I get home, I can try to learn if my wife and kids and, and all, neighbors are all okay with me withdrawing. I think that's interference. So uh, of, of all the things that we do uh, in our daily work, there is interference that we have some ability to manage and control, and there's interference that we have no control over whatsoever, and it happens. So one of the things that I think we need to continue to do is focus on where can I manage this interference load? How can I make it such that I'm not creating interference? And Ryan, I think you said what happens when you uh, give five, six, seven different projects to a person that all have their own complexity. To me, that's creating interference and that's our fault. Something broke in production that was written two years ago that we now have to go back that interferes with our work today, that is part of our world. We have to accept that, and I can't necessarily control that or manage it, but I need to make sure that I pre- provide the opportunity to have cycles to deal with those kinds of interferences without without adding to it. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think that another way that we can take responsibility as management and leaders is enabling the teams to uh, reduce the risk or the the impact of the the accidental complication or the the interference the sk- related to skills and, and technology stacks or welding from Tim's example is to allow them to organize in ways that, that reduce that gap. I think mob programming, pair programming in the software context is a brilliant way to do that. Five people with diverse skill sets coming together on one problem, they're not going to have as big an issue with accidental complication as one person sitting at their keyboard banging their head against the desk. Yeah, and I think uh, paying attention to whip and some of those kinds of things are pretty useful to help manage that as well. If you can visualize Absolutely. the whip, if you start visualizing that whip, I think it's pretty eye-opening when you start actually seeing it, however you want to visualize it, and there's lots of different ways. Well, and, and a lot of that, guys, I think comes back to getting away from the idea that developers are just labor. And that's a very common um, argument that you see on Twitter when we get into uh, the agile discussions, you see it in blog posts and the idea that they're just, that we're just labor. And then it makes it easy to hand three projects to a person and to not let them pair program because, Hey, two, two programmers, one keyboard is, is half as effective, right? Because I'm, I'm paying two people to do the same job. And so you get all these ideas. And I think at the core of it really is just looking at someone as a piece of labor as opposed to uh, a knowledge worker. Mm, like a theory of work, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, the you interesting know. thing is we know this. Um, I'll give you a couple of words to look up because this is so well understood. Um, there's the Yerkes Dodson Law, uh, which is a relationship between stress and performance. The what? I'll, I'll, I'll type it in. We can put it into the notes. It's Yerkes Dodson Law. This is uh, some beautiful stuff. Um, they realize that you know if there's insufficient arousal, there's no interest, nothing gets done. And then it goes to this upside-down U-shape where there's enough interest and excitement and even maybe pressure. You know, Some people need a deadline. And it climbs up the performance. But the trouble is that it collapses very quickly on the other side. You can have so much work that you can't think clearly. And that's kind of what's explained in the papers by Yerkes and Dodson. Um, the other thing is there's something called the Zigarnik effect. And the Zigarnik effect was tied to um, somebody who followed Levine, who we've mentioned already, I think, uh, Levine's law being a, a very famous bit. What happens when we have more than one thing on our mind at a time? The Zigarnik effect is that while one thing is occupying space in our head, we have less room left to think about. So here we are, you know, talking about having too much work to do, too many things to think about. And, you know, the science and the theory behind this is not brand new. It's, I think, the Yerkes Dodson law was 1908. And I think that uh, Zagarnik effect, I'm not sure what the date is on that, but it's a long time. These things should be taught to managers on day one. Yes, well, but manager, another, managers are not made managers on day one. Managers get promoted from being competent at some other product, uh, some other role, some other uh, task-oriented work, generally. In some cases, that's true. I would agree with you, but not in all cases. I, not I not think in all are, those cases. In the military, yeah. bang, you, you, you come into the military as an officer, you're automatically a manager. 
you know, I have locked horns with HR and some companies uh, when it came to hiring people to manage, oversee, whatever term you want to use of knowledge work. And the things I would look for that were interesting to me that I thought would help them be successful were not what HR was looking for. Uh, and so we would have some pretty heated exchanges uh, as to why did I think that and those kinds of things. And, and some of it comes back to just having knowledge of what a knowledge worker does on a day-to-day -day basis is actually quite helpful. Yes, I can get a PMI certification. Yes, I can do all of those things. But unless I've done knowledge work and been around it and understand some of the inner workings, it's harder for me to manage and oversee knowledge workers than uh, if I had uh, hadn't done that. You know, and it doesn't just end there. Um, I've sat down at conferences and talked to people who were just, you know, recent graduates of a management program. And I asked them, um, so, you know, in your MBA, what was the segment like on Deming? And the majority of them had said, who? <laughs> and I right. said, you know, Deming, you know, the, the whole quality management and, you know, the, the discard um, uh, annual assessments. That guy, you know, taught the people how to make stuff efficiently, taught the process to the Japanese manufacturers, caused the birth of the Toyota system. Oh, yeah, we studied. It's like you don't know Deming, but you know Taylor. They knew Taylor real well. Yeah, it, um, and I, I think you're right, Tim. The training can be damaging, and the ones that do get training pass the, the Taylorisms down, and then suddenly we're all surprised uh, that uh, that this management cycle perpetuates. And uh, I think that could be one of the biggest gifts that Agile leaves to the world is that we're looking in different places. You know, we're all, we, you know, Tim, you dig into how the brain functions and we're all uh, working through the book Art of Thought and we look at different uh, psychological works and we look at social, or, um, you know, sociology works and we're looking at philosophy, we're looking at art, we're looking at all these different things and trying to bring together a new theory and maybe just discover the old theories of um, of how to manage knowledge work knowledge workers because as you noted, these theories are in the the early uh, 1900s. I mean that we've known how to do this since early 20th century, yet we have not uh, for some reason those ideas have not stuck. And so perhaps this is the greatest gift that Agile can bring to the workplace is just bringing these ideas forward on on how to really manage. Uh, knowledge workers. Well, and I do have some hope. So if you flash back to the, two th what did we learn in 2015 episode? Um, Jason Tanner did say that, you know, he was, he was hoping for better than waiting for the old guys to die, especially since I'm one of the old guys that he'd really kind of like to see move out of the space. But he's correct. As we start to uh, investigate, experiment, and advance the art of work, and specifically the theory of work for our space, then we don't have to wait for the old, what, what does he call me? He calls me silver, silver alert. We don't have to wait for me to retire for the art to advance, for the theory of work to advance, for knowledge work. And that's what gives me hope. Yeah, I think there are a lot of companies that are really trying to figure out um, knowledge work, management of knowledge work, create an environment for knowledge workers to excel. And I think those are some of the very leading companies that we read a lot about, uh, call them unicorns, call them whatever. And I think as time continues on, uh, other companies will go, dang, I'm, I'm missing something. What is it that Facebook or what is it that Google or, you know, pick one of the companies uh, that we've read about, what are they doing and how do I mirror that? And I actually see some of that today. So, you know, like you, Don, I, I have hope and I see some things turning. It's going to take time though, because there's still a lot of people that are in control that don't believe it, don't buy it, uh, want to work a particular way because it's what they know and they're not interested in learning new. Well, and for some some reasons, rightly so, right? They uh, they've been successful, and they're able to get product out the door. The question will be: Can they continue to do to do that in a changing marketplace and with a changing workforce? I, I don't believe, and I know I've expressed this idea in past episodes, that millennials and, and generations to come after will 
will be willing to work in, in such environments. And what we have to do is figure out how to partition and so at the risk, risk of saying dispense work, as, as we bring in work to an organization and then split it be di between different or teams and groups so that we can get it out the back door faster to provide value to the client, which is really what I think we're after. How do we do it in such a fashion that we don't end up with big bang integration at the back end? You know, somehow we have to build in a culture and a um, under, and, and an understanding of, uh, uh, what does Andy Hunt call it, trace around, you know, a uh, walking skeleton. Build me something. Okay, you five teams are going to be working on this. Let's put one thing together in two weeks that compiles, integrates, and does something, anything. And then we just extend that. And I think that mental shift has to come along with the other shifts we're talking about. You know, I think the uh, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. And that's kind of where my mind went as you were talking through um, how, that, uh, how that could work. Well, I think that the thing missing there is um, the other principle, which uh, Bill Caputo talked about the other day, um, <clears throat> is the, he calls it the 12th, it's, it's not actually 12th in order, um, build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Too often the theory of work is that people are unmotivated and can't be trusted. Um, there's no real thought about necessarily giving them environment and support. What if they just need to learn some stuff? What if they just need a more clear goal? What if they need um, some time to think and, and work things out? Because, you know, we're too, we're too so, we're so bound and determined sometimes to separate people and make them all do their own work alone. And the fact is, when we have, you know, superhuman utilization, we need superhuman people. People are out there looking for unicorn developers when they probably should be making work that human beings can do. Certainly creates a more sustainable world, that's for sure. And, you know, how are we taught it in school to program? How many people got to do pair anything or team anything when we were in school? Well, nope. I did, but I was married to the pair, so that doesn't count probably. <laughs> That's not so the kind I, of pairing they had in mind. So <laughs> I was in school in the early to mid-80s, and throughout every class that I had, it was all individual work until I was a senior and we had a team project. And of all the classes I took, that team project was absolutely the most fulfilling and fun that I had had through four years of comp sci studying. And I, I didn't know why. I, I thought about it, but I wasn't sure why. And now as I look back on that and look at the things that uh, I find value in that, and that get me excited about going to work in the morning, it's a lot of those same kinds of interactions, those same kinds of things. But it's hard to break that mold that we are put in as we're learning. You know, in school, a lot of times it's competition. You know, you're trying to outscore other people to prove who's the best. Um, who are you trying to beat when you go to work, Brad? Every person that could be force ranked higher than you. <laughs> in, in your actual job, though, because I know I've seen Brad's culture. Um, you know, who are people coming in to beat? I, I try not to create an environment like that, I guess. We as humans, I, get, I guess we as humans do want to compete with each other. And I think there's a little bit of that jousting that goes on. And it's usually our peers that we're trying to beat, I guess. No, I appreciate that because I think that's important about our theory of work is the right way to get work out of people in a team by pitting them against each other or by, by giving them some external threat. Yeah, to me, it's the external threat. It's the, hey, there's something that we can do here. Let's go out and prove that we together can do this. There's a big difference, I think, in how you work when you're living among friends versus living among enemies. And I think that's important. I think that part of the the ability to think clearly is the absence of threat. And that's, of course, you know, the work of David Rock, who I'm not going to quote all of his stuff here. Um, you know, the presence of social threats will actually shut down our ability to think. So I'm somewhat reminded of uh, Akoff's, or is it Akoff, uh, Russell, who said, you know, when you have a problem, there's three things you can do. You can solve it, 
which means you look for maximum benefit to you. You can resolve it where you look at uh, beneficial between the two uh, or between the parties involved in the problem. Or you can dissolve it by moving to a different space and making it a non-problem. And oddly enough, after 30 years of self-employment, I realized that I have dissolved this competition problem by just being self-employed. You know, that's my theory of work is, you know, I, I work with clients that I find interesting uh, and beneficial. Uh, sometimes I'd like them to pay a little more attention to me. I'm getting better at working with that. But work is fun for me. And it does. it's not forced on me. It's something I engage in willingly because it motivates me. It, uh, it's exciting. And I, have, I, I get the opportunity to in, help other people find new ways to do better and enjoy more of what they do. I think that's just the way it is with knowledge workers in general. People go into software because they wanted to do cool things with computers. You know, people take a factory job because, well, you know, damn, you need to pay the bills and you need to trade eight hours a day for enough income that you can still buy a car and some groceries and maybe have a kid. Um, you know, I'm not saying that all factory work is awful. My dad was a factory worker. Um, but again, he's also a human being, was a human being. Um, he, uh, he's no longer with us. But he worked in a factory for many years, and he moved into a field called salvage, which doesn't make him a junk man. It means that when something is wrong on the, the assembly line and they've done some damage, you know, that's waste. Um, but you don't want to throw away the engine blocks because somebody drilled the holes too deep. So they take it to salvage, and salvage sees if they can make a solid, reliable repair that will make those all still be valuable. So he was saving things from being scrapped. Um, but it also required, you know, a lot of different thinking and a lot of techniques about how you would do those things. He loved the days he would come home, uh, you know, on the weekends he would be home. He worked a lot of doubles, but he would talk about the things he did at work and, and tools he invented to do jobs and how he came to realizations of why some things were hard and how to fix them. I think that knowledge workers are enthusiastic and we really just need to give them the knowledge and the techniques and the goals they need and stay out of their way. So Tim, you've hit on why I made the switch from programming to management. So I, I realized after a number of years of slinging Java code that I was not going to be amazing at it. You know, the, you guys at industrial logic, you guys are, are amazing at Java and .NET and programming. And it was something that I could be good at that I could make money at, um, but I was not going to be amazing at it. And what I found was that no matter what company I worked at, developers were not treated well. And so they, you know, the, the overburden would happen quite a bit. The competition, all those things were acting against them. They weren't able to do the best kind of work. And so I made the management decision to try to create, or with the idea of, I want to create safe spaces for people to do great work. And I've tried to carry that through and that's actually, you know, as I listen to you talk, that's the motivation. And that's why I like getting up and trying to, to do that. And what I have found is um, it's not simple. And Brad, I think you would agree, um, and I'm sure you have stories in this space too, that when you step into corporate America and you bring these ideas to the forefront, your, your job really becomes human shield until you can actually show some kind of status report that what you're doing is effective Absolutely true. Uh, and that challenge right there, I love that. I love walking into a world that's not working well, typically because of corporate America and lots of other dynamics and figuring out, okay, what are the dynamics that are not allowing this to work well and how do we, how do we earn that trust back and make it work well? And like you, Ryan, create an environment where developers have a good place to be, a, a place where they can come to work and enjoy the work that they're doing uh, and feel safe about the work they're doing, so on and so forth. So, uh, Ryan, I'm right there with you as far as my motivation for why I do what I do. And I'll tell you, the most satisfying moments from what the, the kind of work that we do and what makes um, 
the adventures in, in corporate America worthwhile is when you take the biggest detractor and you turn him into your, your most raving fan. And it, uh, it really is one of the most satisfying, I think, activities or what's one of the more satisfying activities or outcomes that a, that a manager, director, VP, CIO, whatever level you're at can experience is that you've taken this idea, you brought it in, you took the bullets, and then all of a sudden the people that used to be firing at you are now off saying this has to be the way we work. This is the, the way to do things, and, and this is, um, is going to make us competitive. And I, I can't think of a more uh, satisfying outcome than that because it means everyone else gets the the systems of work and the in the environments they need to do great things agreed so what what allows that to happen uh are the people that used to be your critics that are now backing you concerned with whether you use scrum or kanban or paired programming or test driven development or you know pick your agile thing is that what they care about or are they looking at the actual outcome they're looking at outcome and it's trust. I think at the core of that relationship, uh, it's trust. And and I think far too often, um, the business side of the fence, first of all, there's a fence. Uh, and far too often, the people on the business side of that fence have felt uh, either rightly or wrongly that IT has let them down. And so they impose dates, they impose deadlines, because if we give if we give IT a date, at least we know we'll get something. Or at least we know we can drive them to something, we can pressure them to something, and maybe we'll get something out of our investment. Unlike last time when the project went five years and had to get canceled and 10 people got fired and the rest of us were shamed and humiliated. Yeah. Right. So I think the first, the first piece of it is the fence has to come down, which again, if you look back at the manifesto, the, the business and the developers work together daily. The fence is down. We are doing this together. We're learning together. And secondly... We have to deliver. And so when we do these experiments, you know, we have to pick the right projects, the right, uh, the right situ- situation and try to build a team to where we are going to deliver what we promise and that we're going to meet that sprint goal and we're going to meet that next sprint goal. And suddenly, you know, two, four, six, eight weeks into a project, they have something that they're using and now they trust us and now they really want to see what we can do. And suddenly, as a business leader... They have a tool that no one else had in the company, and they're getting this new recognition. They're getting this new um, excitement buzzing around their department, and people start asking them how they're doing it. And that just, that's such a, that, that feedback loop almost feeds on itself, and that energy grows, and, and that trust comes back. And all of a sudden, you're a trusted partner and not this, uh, this group that's, that's approached with caution and disdain. Yeah, that was uh, uh, one of the things that I pushed on really hard when I started uh, a couple of years ago with my current employer was there was no trust between the business and the technology team. And so the first challenge was, okay, how do we start earning that trust back? And it absolutely is earned and and we had to earn it. But that took some decisions and some courage uh, to manage expectations and pare down the number of things we are expected to do managing WIP so that we could actually allow our team to focus on fewer things. Once we started doing that, then all of a sudden we started delivering and people saw it and went, hey, that's pretty cool. I wonder if they can do more. Uh, And it kind of led to the point where we are now where we have a pretty good flow of ideas coming through the technology team and we just continue to flow and, and deliver. It's a good place to be, but it's not easy getting there. And I think the technology team, and I mentioned this earlier, has to have their heads and their hearts in the right places. Fortunately for me, that was the case when I arrived. Yeah, it, it's one of those, it's, it's a hard-fought and hard-earned transaction to get that trust back. But once you have it, it's quite amazing uh, what your teams can do. I, I refer to that as the trust transact. So somebody invests an initial amount of trust, which basically means autonomy, really. Um, and in return, there's delivery of something and there's transparency. And then as the delivery ramps up, then the trust builds up and you again are you know giving more trust in exchange for more delivery or more quality sometimes we see um situations where there's so little trust that of course you're being micromanaged you know we've only ever seen failure and then when that gets broken and i worked for brad so i know what kind of a manager brad is and i know that this is true what he's saying 
it's about stepping in and making the trust happen. And it's a powerful thing. That transaction grows. Yeah, highlighting transparency is something that, that we left out, but is, is so crucial. Because, uh, you know, Tim, you hit on it. There's some cases where micromanagement makes perfect sense. And in even a few of those cases, it's the only management style that would be effective, right? But when the work becomes transparent and that trust is built, you know, I, I remember a business partner that I had at a past job and, uh, you know, he, his frustration was, was growing project was over was overdue uh the expenses were running out of control i had just come into the company and so the one conversation no one would have with him was where exactly the project was at and so i just opened up all the books here is where you are uh and where do you want to be and and it seemed like just that simple act of opening up the project plan opening up the budget showing a, a very real representation like hey let's get a demo set up let's see what software you have now and uh, just that single step changed the, the tone of the discussion and, and let us build on that. So I, I think that's a great call out that you made that uh, transparency coupled with delivery is, is what is that's the currency of the trust. I, I couldn't agree more. Yep, totally agree. All right. So, so the managers, that. managers dominated. Tim and Don, you can have it back. This is not a question of dominance. There, it's a question of timing. It's a question of ebb and flow. There's a time for everything. And so as much as I've never been a manager, I support them and recognize their very essential place in business. As the independent agile coach, I bring a wonderful outside view into their system. But they have a fiduciary responsibility. You have fiduciary responsibilities. I do not. And there has to be a blending and co-working to help things happen. So I was perfectly happy. I was kind of enjoying it because it's part of the world I don't get to listen to a lot. You guys don't sit behind the closed doors and hear the discussions that, Brad, you're definitely having the higher level discussions. I'm, I'm more at a tactical level. Uh, still, but um, but yeah, the, the the closed door sessions are fascinating, and it's amazing what we go through. You know, you guys come in, and typically it's it's people like us, like Brad and I, that bring you in, and the amount of cover we have to provide is, is amazing. I've I've had both sides of this. I've been a developer, I've been a manager, and I've been a consultant. And uh, the one thing I did have right with my management, I was I was the umbrella. It was my job to to shield the people and let them do work. And um, sometimes, you know, I had to take abuse in their name um, and not pass it on. And that was cool. Um, but I had teams that were able to work together who weren't afraid of each other, who weren't uh, under constant threat, and who actually did good work every time, usually faster and in better style than people expected. So uh, but, uh, Josh Karievsky did this thing, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, um, of course, full, full, you know, disclosure, I'm at industrial logic and I'm happy about that. Um, Josh Karievsky is our leader there, um, owner of the company. He came up with four things that he thinks were really important to let knowledge workers work. And he listed them as number one is, is you know, the goal of making the users awesome. And you've talked about that connection. Number two was, uh, to learn rapidly, which is close to my heart. I think that's so important. Um, also deliver value continuously. And you've heard that be a theme in our conversation, that I did not plug that in. I haven't steered us in this direction. But I'm happy to see we went there. And the last part was to make safety a prerequisite, not uh, an add-on or a bolt-on. But without safety, there can't be trust. And without trust you can't be a team Lencioni explained that in five dysfunctions i don't know that it's entirely perfect um i would like to see uh, maybe some more writing about having clear goals and um small decisions firmly made but i think it's really important to consider that maybe he has this thing 99 percent right already yeah, Tim, I think that's a beautiful way to wrap up this episode of the podcast. I think Josh has laid out a, a really interesting vision for modern Agile, and I think those four points are certainly at the core of it, and uh, I think it, it hits on most of the 
most of the, the highlights that we, that we discussed. So my thought was to wrap back around uh, to the original question. Where does work come from? Now, we talked about a bunch of things between the time we started in here, but where does work come from? We talk about why Mike's is happy, what we should be doing, but where does it come from? It comes from someone wanting something they don't have. That's where work comes from. How we get it to them is, I think, largely what we talked about. I, I could be very mistaken. I'm willing to listen. No, I think you're right. I think it is a matter of um, there's something that somebody out there wants, feels they need, whatever, and how do we make that happen? And where we spend a lot of our time is figuring out how do we make that happen and do it well. Or sometimes do it at all. Uh, yeah, that's fair. And then I think the choices are that we can do it in joy. Um, geek joy is the phrase that Mike Hill and, and Alex Harms like. Um, we can do it in joy or we can be forced to do it. And we have to choose what kind of a culture we want. Well, and it comes back to as well that uh, this is all voluntary, right? So we, it's a voluntary type relationship that we have. It's none of us are forced to work for the people that we work for. None of us are forced to take the money they offer us. And so we have to decide for ourselves uh, which systems of work are acceptable, uh, which systems of work can we be effective in and where we can derive the most self-worth and also create value through outcomes and, and actual production for other people. And, uh, and that's really the trick of it, right? It's the, what do we need to be able to do the best work possible and who's willing to provide that so that we in turn can provide them the thing that they want. Yeah, and I think there was a part of the conversation earlier was why why do some environments have people that are just there to turn the crank? It's uh, just coding um, and not looking for better ways and some of those things. And I think it's it ties back to, you're right, we're not forced to do this, but it's the trade-offs that we must make in order to effect that change and look for something different. And many of us are not willing to to take those steps and deal with those trade-offs. And so we end up getting stuck. I believe we have hit our time box uh, for this particular episode of Agile for Humans. And so at this point of the show, Brad, we like to uh, allow our guests to, uh, first of all, let the listeners know uh, how to reach out if they have any questions or if they want to continue the, the, the discussion with you. And then also if you want to promote anything that you have going on, any 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 books that you find interesting, any events or conferences you're going to be speaking at or attending, anything like that. So feel free. This is your time for uh, plugs and, and how people can reach out and uh, continue the discussion with you. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a heavy Twitter consumer, sometimes a Twitter contributor, and I can be found at RAS30, R-A-S-S-3-0 on Twitter. Um, certainly reach out to me there if there's any interest in having further conversations. Um, you know, one thing that I have wanted to always do, and I haven't done it yet, uh, is to actually speak at the Agile Conference. So this year I took the step to actually be a reviewer so I can kind of see what it's about, and uh, hopefully someday I'll, I'll get there. I do find that because I'm considered a manager, hanging out with the coaches sometimes is an uncomfortable thing maybe for me. Maybe for them, maybe it's more me. Well, thank you for letting me hang out with a couple of pretty cool coaches tonight. That was awesome. Tim, how about you? What do you got going on? What's coming up next for you? And do you got any books that uh, people absolutely must read? Oh, goodness. It's so hard to rein back at this moment. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot going on in the modern Agile space. Josh Kariofsky is going out with that. And I want I to give a shout out to him because, uh, you know, I've just basically summarized his work. Um, but also, uh, we're going to be at Agile and Beyond, a number of us from Industrial Logic. Um, we're going to be at uh, Agile 2016. We're going to be at Agile Indie, some of us. Um, there's a lot going on. It's just beautiful stuff. But I also don't want to hog that. Um, there is uh, a friend of mine named Alex Harms, who I was hoping was going to be on the, on the podcast tonight. Um, if you look for um, Maitreya, it's spelled M-A-I-T-R-I-A. -I -I. You will find her podcast where she and, uh, among other people, um, Mike Hill, have talked about connecting with geek joy. And I think that that's a good connection to this conversation. And, of course, follow Agile Otter because uh, we, we've referenced it a lot and uh, there's going to be some more stuff 
Don Gray, how can people reach out and uh, send their angry and upset letters to you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don, how can people reach out and praise your your wonderful wisdom? No, and, no, uh, no. They, they, it's okay for them to be upset. <laughs> uh, you know, Jerry Weinberg has taught me that, you know, people can want what they want. They can feel what they feel. And that's okay. I don't have to do anything about it, but they can still feel that way. Man, if only I could just live that. <laughs> yeah. It's so wonderful. Yeah, so we can't all be Jerry Weinberg. Uh, <laughs> and Tim, there was my Jerry Weinberg quote. So uh, right now I'm up to my ears in reviewing sessions for the leadership track for Agile 2016, which Ryan our wonderful host is also a track reviewer, and he's doing a fine job. Uh, well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, at Donald D. Gray for Twitter. I don't tweet that often. I could tweet more, but right now I'm having a wonderful time working with a great client, and um, my time's pretty well consumed. And then in the evenings, I wander by Skype and Ryan's pulls me into these conversations. <laughs> and I, I'm very grateful you join us, Don. Thank you for the offer. Yeah, it was a pleasure and meeting I, both of you, and I would be happy to contribute again if uh, the spirit so moved you. And I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. It's at Ryan Ripley on Twitter. RyanRipley.com is where you're probably at listening to this podcast right now, unless you downloaded it on iTunes or Stitcher. If you did download it on iTunes, a quick comment review would be much appreciated. It helps get the word out about the podcast and keeps our uh, listening audience growing and, and thriving. And, and we get all these great ideas back. It just helps us out. Would be much appreciated. Would also love to hear your feedback. So if you are on the RyanRipley.com blog site and you're listening to a particular episode that's caught your fancy, a comment on the blog would be excellent. Love to hear your thoughts on the topics, on the, on the podcast itself, and anything we can do to add more value to your work life. And that's really it, guys. Thanks for listening. We're glad you're here. We hope you found this valuable, and have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com. <laughs>